Welcome in the Matt Bernier Show here on DRF TV, live.drf.com, livestream.com, the Daily Racing Forms Twitter handle that would be at DRF Inside Post, as well as the Daily Racing Forms Facebook page. My name is Matt Bernier. You can follow me on Twitter at Bernier underscore Matt. This is the preview edition of the Matt Bernier Show. We're looking at races coming up this Saturday, March the 10th. If you're watching this, live.drf.com, livestream.com. Thank you for doing so. If you check it out, podcast, again, you've got YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, video.drf.com. The main event this weekend, there are really three of them, and I know we've got grade one races on the West Coast anyway, and we'll get into those in a little bit, two of them anyway. Uh, but the main event and the main attraction this time of year, I sound like a broken record every week I come on this show or the recap edition and say three-year-old, three-year-old, three-year-old. Well, there's a reason because everyone's talking about the three-year-olds. This is our marquee division. Uh, whether you agree with that or not is whether it should be, it is. That's a fact, fact of the matter. People love the three-year-olds getting closer and closer to the Kentucky Derby the first Saturday in May. We had some big racing last weekend. You saw the Fountain of Youth. You saw Promises Fulfilled throw his hat into the ring. Now, all of a sudden, here we are. We've got three big preps coming up this weekend. You've got the Tampa Bay Derby down at Tampa Bay Downs. You've got the Gotham up at Aqueduct, a one-turn mile. So a little bit of a peculiar derby prep, possibly. And then you've also got the big one out in Southern California, the San Felipe, the big matchup between McKinsey and Bolt Doro. Let's start off, and I'm not going to go and do the full nuts and bolts and give out my odds for these races because we're going to go over all three of these on Out of the Gate, this week's edition. That'll be following this show on Friday if you're watching live. Otherwise, you can find it on video.drf.com or the Daily Racing Forms YouTube channel. So we're going to go over those three races on that show. So I don't want to go and beat them to death. So I'm just going to kind of give a quick little overview, and then we'll dive into two of the grade one races out at Santa Anita on Saturday. Fingers crossed the weather cooperates with us. It looks like it's going to be a little bit on the soggy side, but we'll go over the big cap. We'll also go over the kill row mile. The three-year-olds, though. Let's start off with the Tampa Bay Derby. The Tampa Bay Derby, I don't want to say is the most interesting race to me because you've got the two big dogs out on the West Coast. You've got some nice horses up at Aqueduct in the one-turn mile. But the Tampa Bay Derby at least feels like you could possibly have a new horse throw their hat into the ring uh, like a world of trouble, if you will. He most recently was brilliant when he won the Pasco, but again, now he's got to stretch out to two turns for the first time. Haven't seen him since January. You know, do you get something big from Untamed Domain for Graham Motion? This is a horse that he's got a big pedigree. You see he's by Animal Kingdom. He looks like he's a turf horse, but I understand why they're going to give this a shot. Everybody gets derby fever this time of year, and he's a nice horse. He's talented. Why not take a chance and then you get the top two coming out of the local prep for this race the sam f davis we're going to go take a look at that race right now richard grunder with the call he strikes to the lead flame away is battling back gamely down along the inner rail these two are locked in battle flame away is coming back trying to pull the upset catholic boy is all out these two matching strides vino rosso defeated down to the wire flame away catholic boy on the outside flame away and jose lascano upset winner of the sam davis and make flame away gets the better of the top two catholic boy and vino rosso catholic boy is going to bypass the tampa bay derby for the florida derby at the end of this month you do get Vino Rosso back, though, and I think it's interesting. Vino Rosso is a horse that I've been very, very uh, high on recently. I look at that race more and more, and I love it more and more. Seems like he's still very, very green. The blinkers go on, and I think most people look at that as a positive. And I kind of do, but at the same time, it terrifies me. Todd Pletcher's record, past five years, dirt, first-time blinkers in graded stakes races, one for 17 with a 61-cent ROI. This is not a positive move for Todd. But I think it is worth noting that maybe you can try to, and you can go into Formulator and filter that even more if you want to the three-year-olds because this just feels like a horse that he kind of needs blinkers. And I don't know, all of a sudden, if this wasn't a graded stakes race, do those numbers just jump up exponentially if it's just a random three-year-old getting the blinkers on for the first time? Possibly. I, I think if he can put it together, he looks like he wants to run all day. He's a big, good-looking son of Curlin. They paid a lot of money for him. He's got high profile connections. Johnny V. Look, I know there is politics all over the place about rides and whatnot. You can't convince me that this is not a positive that John Velasquez is here at Tampa Bay Downs on Saturday riding a three-year-old that to date he's eligible for what a non-winner is a two other than. He's going to stay here and ride this horse and he's going to let the champ go to the West Coast, world approval, and he's going to give that mount up. 
You can't tell me that that's not a positive, that he doesn't think highly of this horse. Todd has talked about it. He thinks that this horse is quite good. Uh, Vino Rosso is where I'm going to go in the Tampa Bay Derby. I think he's got a big, big chance in here. Flame away. Respect him. I think Mark Cassie's done a tremendous job. I thought he caught a little bit of a speed-friendly racetrack in the Sam F. Davis. That helped him, but he's tenacious. He doesn't want to let you by. I think he's going to catch a little bit more heat in here, particularly from World of Trouble. So I think the Tampa Bay Downs race, all of the racing, top to bottom, is phenomenal. If you're going to be in the area, come on out. Myself and Marty McGee will be going over seminars down there at Tampa Bay Downs on Saturday. We'll be going over some other stuff from raffles, questions, you name it. We'll be down there. So if you're in the area down in Oldsmar, come on out. We'll have a good day at the races on Saturday afternoon. Let's go up to Aqueduct. In New York, Ozone Park. Hopefully it's not as snowy and nasty as it's been the past day and a half that is, this is being recorded. But the one-turn mile changes the dynamic of it as far as a prep race is concerned, simply because how often do you see a one-turn prep as far as a Kentucky Derby is concerned? This is not, again, when they moved from the inner dirt to the main track and they added that second turf course, it kind of changed the landscape of the three-year-old, certainly in New York, but even now all of a sudden, if you run in that most recent race, and off the top of my head, it's, uh, it's slipping my mind right now, it was the Withers. And you know what? Funny enough, we're going to be taking a look at the, with the Withers right now. You know what? Throw it up there right now. This is the stretch run of the Withers. Turning for home, Avery Island, Firenze Fire in pursuit now second. Marconi on the outside finding his best stride. There's an eighth of a mile to go. Avery Island is called on to finish the job. He leads it by two. Marconi and Firenze Fire both firing, but Avery Island maintains a comfortable margin with a 16th to go. Firenze Fire trying so hard in second. Avery Island is simply too good, and he wins the withers by just over two lengths. Forense Fire second. Okay, so Avery Island gets it done, but Forense Fire comes back. Forense Fire at nine furlongs. I think that's a, a little bit pushing it. We're getting to the very end there. We're stretching them thin. But my, my bigger point was, before I lost my train of thought with who, which race it was, the idea of going from nine furlongs to a one-turn mile back to nine furlongs for the Wood Memorial, this is not a very fluid sort of transition. And I think that's why you've got some connections shipping out of town, looking to stay with the two-turn races. But also, you get the beautiful scenario like a Forense Fire that shows up here. You get a horse like Enticed coming up from South Florida, one-turn mile. Free Drop Billy, interesting move. Very, very interesting move here with this horse because it looks like he was... I think he might be still the best horse that Romans has as far as the three-year-olds are concerned. And I know Promises Fulfilled just won the Fountain of Youth last Saturday down at Gulfstream Park. But Free Drop Billy, to me, gives off that vibe, that impression that he's a classic horse, whether it's the Derby or the Preakness or the Belmont or the Travers when we get into the summer. To me, these are the kind of races for him. I'm, I'm fascinated that they're going to turn him back to a one-turn mile. I wonder if it's just simply, was it because you didn't want to deal with good magic last weekend? Or a lot of people have alluded to it on Twitter. Dale Romans is a sharp guy, also trains Promises Fulfilled, also trains Storm Runner. Maybe he knew that they were really, really ready to go. Not that Free Drop Billy wasn't, but you know that this is a, let's call a spade a spade. This is not the strongest group that you've seen on paper. Forensic Fire, again, really nice horse. Uh, enticed, nice horse. But after that, these other ones, they've got some things to prove. Not saying that they can't. And I don't know who I'm necessarily going to pick just yet in this race. Still have some work to do, but... I mean, the idea of Free Drop Billy turning back slightly in distance and then ultimately going to have to stretch out again, I think it's fascinating. The Gotham may not be your traditional prep for the Kentucky Derby, but I think you can glean a lot of things from the outcome. We'll find out how everything shakes down Saturday afternoon. And then I think the race that most folks are going to be most interested in from the three-year-old prep standpoint on Saturday is the San Felipe out at Santa Anita, eight and a half furlongs, field of eight, Everyone's going to key on him um, in on McKinsey as well as Bolt Doro. Okay, the idea of those two throwing it down, salivating, mouth watering. Love the idea of it. But there are other horses in here. Ayakara is no slouch. I think he was on the best part of the racetrack in the Bob Lewis down on the inside. I thought the inside did well that day. Something to keep in mind going forward and uh, foreshadowing into that San Anita handicap talk that we'll have in a little bit. You also have a horse like Kentaka. Kentaka is stretching out in distance now for the first time for Jerry Hollendorfer. Whenever I see Jimmy Creed in the pedigree, I'm, I'm a little bit leery. I don't know how far ultimately this horse is going to want to go, but... Boy, on paper, he really stacks up. He's nice. He's got the highest last out buyer in the field with a 99. There's nothing not to like about him other than now he's going to be facing some better horses and stretching out in distance. First things first, let's talk about the two big boys in here. Let's take a little bit of a 
backtrack. It's been a while, and I'm amazed at the amount of people that are just completely off the Bolt Doro bandwagon. This, to me, was one of the most impressive two-year-old races since I've been paying attention to the game that I've seen. This was his effort in the front runner, Michael Rona with the call swing for home bolt doro charges into the lead from take the 101 they're followed by solomini well clear of zatta and encumbered next is ayakara but bolt doro is forging clear this is a high caliber cult we're witnessing the emergence of a star as bolt doro treats his rivals to a comprehensive walloping in the front runner scores by seven lengths visually that checked every box there was nothing bad about that race and it came up enormous on the speed figure scales, whether it's time form, whether it's buyer, whether it's anything else. It was an incredible, incredibly fast race. Then all of a sudden the Breeders' Cup Juvenile comes and Good Magic is the hotness now. He is he's the latest and greatest and he looks great out there. I understand. But you can't tell me. I I have long been of the belief, and I know I'm probably in the minority, that Bolt Doro ran the best race that day. When you carry 78 more feet than Good Magic does, I know, okay, look, you got beat by almost five and a half lengths. I get that. But 78 feet, that is nothing to sneeze at. And I know outside was where you wanted to be at Del Mar and Breeders' Cup weekend. But still, the point is, he carried an absolute acre of ground throughout. And he was 60 feet farther than Solomini. Solomini, all he did was come back to be disqualified from a grade one. And, oh, he was only a length behind him. I think Bolt Doro was the best two-year-old last year. I made it clear when we went over my Eclipse Award ballot on this show that I picked him. I voted for him for two-year-old champion. Does does good magic's lackluster performance last weekend dissuade me from a horse like Bolt Doro? No. Perhaps the connections do. They've never been in a position like this. Mick Ruiz, owner-trainer. You know, it's one of those things that the spotlight is on you until you get to a situation like this. Who knows how you'll handle it. It sounds like they're already kind of hedging, saying if it's a sloppy racetrack, they're not going to run. They're going to wait for the following week to want it, to run in the Rebel down at Oakland Park. To me, he I feel like there are already people doubting this horse. And I, I again, I, I can understand, I can see a scenario why you would. I'm looking at it saying, even if it's sloppy, he's got to run. You got to get a race into him. We are up against it. You can't be burning weeks. Because now if you go in the Rebel... I don't want to say your hand is forced to run in a race like the Arkansas Derby, but if you run in the Rebel, then you're only looking at, what, maybe three weeks till the Santa Anita Derby, three weeks till the Bluegrass, three weeks till the Wood. Then you're going to wait. If you want to wait for the Arkansas Derby, that's all well and good, give you a nice four-week gap. But the problem then becomes now you're looking at less time to get to the Kentucky Derby. So uh, to me, I don't own the horse. I'm not the trainer, luckily. That nobody has to worry about that. Mick Ruiz is the one that makes the decision. I would run him regardless. I don't care if it's wet. I don't care if it's bone dry. He needs a race. He's got to run. I would run him on Saturday, and I think he's got a big chance to win. The horse he has to beat is McKenzie. McKenzie, all he's done, he's 3-for-3 three three. technically. There's an asterisk there. He didn't actually finish first in the Los Al Futurity, but he did get the job done, so technically he was put up via disqualification. Technically, he is a grade one winner, but... He is really a fascinating animal for Bob Baffert. We're going to go back and take a look at the stretch run of his most recent race. This was his victory in the sham. Timbers could not go with McKenzie. Just took up a little bit there, but looked to be tiring at the time. My boy Jack running fourth. McKenzie strides clear at the eighth pole. Puts two lengths on all-out blitz. Four lengths away. Shiver me Timbers with my boy Jack. But it's a domineering display by the ultra-talented McKenzie as he takes the sham while well in hand. Three and a half lengths to all out. Blitz. Visually, no knocks whatsoever. Speed-wise, he's got all the figs. He's got positive formulator facts in his corner for Baffert. I think the pedigree is there. I understand the folks that look at it and say, maybe he doesn't want to go mile and a quarter. The good news is he's only got to go eight and a half on Saturday. I don't think that the distance is ultimately a problem. I don't think that the surface is going to be an issue for him. I just think there's there's a lot to like about a horse like McKinsey. He still does his thing with the tail. Whatever. Maybe that's just him. Uh, not going to bother me. Until it becomes a problem, I'm not going to look at here and, and just keep waiting for something to come up from it. It is what it is. It's a little bit of a quirk. There should be some pace in here. you got Lombo. you got Aquila stretching out. You've got Peace taking the blinkers off, but he likes to be a little bit closer. I think it's a fascinating race. Fascinating weekend of preps for the three-year-olds. Coast to coast. you got one-turn miles in New York. Nice race down at Tampa Bay Downs. And then a big one out at Santa Anita. We'll find out. Hopefully Mother Nature cooperates all over the place. Again, it sounds like Southern California could be a little bit wet. 
perhaps that alters the way these races are run out on the West Coast, and that'll lead us in to the two races that we'll dive into. Nuts and bolts, Santa Anita Handicap, Kill Row Mile. Race 10 at the Great Race Play Saturday afternoon. The Grade 1 Santa Anita Handicap. It's an historic event. Uh, maybe it's lost a little bit of its luster in recent years. The Dubai World Cup, the Pegasus World Cup, these things have sort of taken away a little bit of the spectacle and the fun of arguably the first big, big older race of the year. Now it's second, maybe third. Uh, nonetheless, it's always a fun race. It's one of my favorite races. This is usually one of my favorite days out at Santa Anita. San Felipe, you get the three-year-olds. You get the triple bend, which I think they just recently, over the past handful of years, moved it around to this day. So you get some good quality older horses sprinting. Then you also get the Kilroy Mile, which is always one of my favorite races of the year. Hopefully the weather kind of cooperates. We'll get into that race in a minute. But the big one, the granddaddy. The Santa Anita Handicap. Let's take a look at the field. On the far right side, those are my odds, not the morning line. That is my value line. What I believe would be fair odds on each one of these horses from a win standpoint in post position order. The number one top of the game, 13-1 to 1 for Vladimir Sorin and Kent DeSormo. Thought he ran fine in the San Pasquale, considering I thought inside did well. He was 2-3 path throughout between runners, contesting the pace. Just didn't have a heck of a lot down the lane. There's a part of me that wonders... Did that the native diver when he was forced to check really really hard? Then he came back in the San Gabriel. Should that have been a red flag that possibly the, the feet have kind of gone away on him? Notice he had a giant giant gap as far as racing was concerned from February to October of last year. Uh, I think when he's right, he's nice. I also wonder about the distance. I feel like he's much better suited at that flat mile. Thirteen to one for top of the game. The number two is Prime Attraction. I made him four to one for Jim Cassidy, Tiago Pereira. I think there's a scenario where again, if you think the inside was good like I do, he was four or five path basically throughout. He's nudged along, pushed five, six path turn for home, and he stayed on. He was only beaten by a little bit more than a length and a half. I, I think the additional distance is only going to be beneficial for him. From a speed figure standpoint, he's not far off from what it would take to get the job done. I think minimum a 100 buyer will win this race. He's done that on three occasions. I know two of those happen to be on turf, but I think he's capable. Four to one for me on prime attraction. The three is Curl and Road. Distance, you know, is not a problem. The question is the long layoff. We have not seen him since the Pacific Classic back at Del Mar in August of last year off the long layoff. He's run okay off layoffs in the past, but he's not necessarily one that I'd be running the windows to bet 24 to 1. The number four is Giant Expectations. He's cross-entered in the triple bend as of this taping right now at about 1 o'clock on Thursday. 50-50, Peter Erton says about whether he'll run in the triple bend or in this spot. I think he's better suited going 7 eighths than he is at 10. But he could be forwardly placed in a race where there aren't any true sort of burners early on. I've made him 19 to 1. I'm a little dubious about the distance. Opportunity, one of my all-time sons. He's the number 5. I've made him 6 to 1. That one-on-one -on -one buyer in the San Antonio is the highest last out. I don't know that I believe it. I think this horse has lost a step. To me, the Clark of 2016 was sort of the the sign that maybe he didn't really want to do it too much anymore. Then he comes back and runs really, really well in the San Antonio. I was wrong that day. I liked more spirit. He comes back in Dubai, and the wheels fell off. He was terrible that day, and he's gone for a long time. Comes back in the Comet at the top. Not going to hold that against him at a mile. He wants more. The Clark, it at least showed that he still had a pulse, that he could still come on and still had a little bit left in the tank. The San Antonio, I thought he was inside throughout. I know there wasn't a lot of pace, and he was kind of taken out of his element. He likes to come off from well off the pace, but I didn't think he'd do any running. And then he's gone for a long time. We haven't seen him since before New Year's, so he's coming off of a pretty significant layoff here. Um, look, his best race, he's certainly there. I think the distance is always going to be beneficial for him, regardless of what the one for eight overall record says. I think this is what he wants to do. I just don't know where he is. I made him six to one. The five is feared the cowboy Javier Efren Loza Jr. Six to one. I think this is a nice horse. I think the distance is going to be beneficial. Don't know if he's quite this good. I thought running fourth in the Pegasus was great. Thought winning that run two back in the Harlands Holiday, tremendous. Loza Jr. has placed this horse brilliantly throughout his career. And you know what? He probably deserves to take a shot at a big race like this. Six to one. Don't think he's totally without a chance. The seven is Accelerate. I think he's the horse to beat. I think he could be forwardly placed. I made him three to one. The one-on-one -on -one buyer, Cole Highest last out, along with Opportunity. Uh, he didn't have the best of trips, certainly, in that most recent run, yet he overcame that in the San Pasquale. The one thing I'll say is, again, I thought inside was good. And even with having to check turning onto the backside, you want to talk about just the rail opening up wide, turning for home. He shot down the inside. He finished well. Ten furlongs, a great unknown for this horse. 
you have to respect him, though. He is the sharpest horse in the race right now. I made him 3-1. to one, And the number 8 to round out the field is Muptahij. The other Baffert. And your blinkers come off. He was much more forwardly placed than he's accustomed to being in that most recent run. I don't want to hold that against him. I just thought he was pretty terrible, all things considered, to be honest with you. Now you get Mike Smith second off the bench. Perhaps he moves forward. He never changed leads in the San Pasquale. The other thing that, again, this is just me reading between the lines a little bit, and you can it can be dangerous, but sometimes it's something to keep in the back of your mind. Mubtahij is owned by Sheikh Mohammed bin Khalif Al Maktoum, the whole you know part of the family out there in Dubai. To me... If he's ready to go, he's not running here. He's running in Dubai because he's run there for the past two years. Uh, three years if you go all the way back to when he won the UAE Derby. I think this is a nice horse. I don't think he's a superstar. I think, to me, it's a red flag that he's even here, that he's not going to Dubai. Uh, I made him 8-1. to one. I, I don't like him really at all in this spot. So let's get to the pick and play. The pick for me, and we're going to go take a look at that San Pasquale right now. The pick is Prime Attraction. He's the number two horse. You see him, he's on the outside, and he's coming along. Again, my whole piece for this argument is 10 furlongs works for him. He's run fast enough in the past, and I think inside was where he wanted to be in the San Pasquale. Now, hopefully, we get a little bit of a fairer racetrack. He's going to be down to the inside anyway, so that certainly doesn't hurt. And he has a little bit of tactical speed. I need Tiago Pereira to use him a little bit, establish some sort of a stalking gear, and then just try to outlast everyone. Because really, I don't think he's necessarily as talented as some of the best in here. Well, I shouldn't even say that. I mean, I've always thought he has tremendous ability, just the mind is not necessarily there. I think he just needs to run the race of his life. Let's put it that way. And I think he's capable of doing that. I think he's got a big chance in here for Jim Cassidy. Made him 4-1. to one. So the play, I'm not going to get cute. I'm just going to play $20 to win on him. I think he's going to be north of the 4-1. to one. I think he's going to be in that 6-1 to one range. I don't know that people truly buy into him or think that he's a, a legitimate talent. Um, I think Accelerate is the horse to beat. The 10 furlong is a little bit of an unknown. But, you know what, I, I just think there's, there's enough for me to look at Prime Attraction and say, you know what, he is an attractive wagering proposition on Saturday afternoon. Rain or shine, uh, give me Prime Attraction, 4-1 to one or greater. I'll bet $20 to win on him. In this year's edition of the Santa Anita Handicap, let's quickly move on over to the turf for the grade one Frank E. Kilrow. Last race we'll touch on for this week's edition of the Matt Bernier Show, the preview edition. Let's go to the Frankie Kilrow Mile. One mile on the turf course. These are older horses, nice horses, classy old veterans that like to go out there and just get the job done. The problem is you have one horse that's going to take a, a serious, serious beating in here. Boy, world approval looks like he's going to be tough. But let's go in post position order. The number one, Free Rose, 13 to 1 for Richard Baltus, Kent DeSormo. I think this is an interesting horse. If you're playing in a contest and you need a little bit of a number at some point, perhaps Free Rose is the one who gets lost in the shuffle. His two most recent starts, I thought they were both okay, not great. Most recently, he was close to a hot pace. That was in the San Marcos going 10. Two starts back, he went nine off the long layoff in the San Gabriel. I think he's a miler at heart. He ran really well in the Shoemaker last year. I think if he runs something like that, he's at least mildly intriguing at what should be a very, very square number. I made him 13-1. to 1. The number two is Bowie's Hero for Phil D'Amato, Corey Nakatani. Made him 13-1 to 1 as well. Second off the bench, he was a half-length beaten by Ohm most recently in the Thunder Road. To me, it felt like I know he had to put in a little bit of a... An extended run, a sustained bid. I don't want to call it quite a half-mile run, but let's say three-eighths. I thought he hung a little bit. Maybe he was tired. Maybe he needed one off the bench, and maybe we'll get a forward move if we do. He's certainly a player. I just wanted to see him actually go by Ohm in that spot. I made him 13-1. to one. Number three is next shares. Very similar scenario to Ohm. Or I'm sorry, to uh, Bowie's hero in that most recent run, the Thunder Road. The difference is this horse came from way out of it and he got an electric pace set up with ohm going out there and just going breakneck early on and he still couldn't get the job done i think there was going to be fair pace in here i just look at it and go you're facing better horses now i'm not entirely sold that made him 19 to 1 the number four is syntax another damato runner off of a long layoff you get franco aboard we haven't seen him since beaten half length third in the Charlie Whittingham last year going longer I think ultimately you look and see once D'Amato got this horse going long really long that's when he did his best running to me this is probably nothing more than a means to an end get one into him if you can get a piece great but probably get him out to a longer distance I don't love him in here I made him 24 to 1 the number five is world approval he's a champion won the older one the turf champion the eclipse award last year 
Um, I think he's really, really nice for Mark Cassie. 105 buyer in that Tampa Bay stakes most recently. That was his first start of the new year. Six years old now. Still looks very, very good. A little bit more workmanlike maybe than I would like to have seen in that Tampa Bay race. But John Velasquez said right after, boy, that mile on the 16th. 16th of a mile extra. That's the big sort of concern there. He thought maybe he just got a little bit tired at the end. This, it's also worth noting that they initially had talked about going to Dubai to run in the turf. That's at nine furlongs. Mark Cassie, I think, smartly looked at it and said, this horse does his best at a flat mile. And let's all of a sudden point our attention to Keeneland with their big grade one in the spring with a quick stop in the kill row. It makes me just at least mildly, mm, is this nothing more than a means to an end? It's still a great one, I understand, but it, it feels like they want the Keeneland race. John Velasquez doesn't go out to the West Coast. Not that you lose much with Flavian Pratt getting aboard, but it just, I don't know. It, it gives me at least enough cause for pause to say he's not a slam dunk. I think he's way the horse to beat. I think he's the most likely winner. Made him 7-5. to five. But there's just a part of me that looks at it and goes, meh. Maybe maybe there's a scenario where this is the spot where you can get him and he can stub his toe and you can get the better of him at what's a very, very short number. Again, I made him 7-5. to five. I think he goes off shorter than that. That is world approval. Although, I will say, if there is moisture in the racetrack, remember back to that yield and go of it back up at Saratoga last year when he won the four-star Dave. If it is wet, this horse, you know he can handle that. That's not an issue. The number six is what of you. If what of you was what he once was, I'd be interested in him. I don't think he is anymore. I think he's lost a little bit on the fastball. I made him 19-1. to 1. You know his game, though. Try to send on the stretch out from the six and a half furlong race. The seven is Ohm for Dan Hendricks. Pratt goes aboard world approval. You get Mike Smith on this horse. I have to be honest, I would ride him the exact same way that Pratt did last time. Just go. Try to bottom out this field. I know that you run the risk of getting hooked in some sort of an absolute barn burner with what a view. But that's the only way I think that Ohm can win this race is to just run like that. He went unbelievably fast early, 22-2 and two for the opening quarter, and he just hung on. He was game at the end. I thought it was a big effort, great ride. We'll find out if Smith can replicate that with Ohm. I made him 6-1. to one. And number eight is Channel Maker, shipping in from the East Coast for Bill Mott. Javier has the mount. To me, this is a horse. I've always been a fan of this horse. I've always thought he does best mile and an eighth, mile and a quarter. Well, then all of a sudden, there's a, a camp that thinks that he's best at a mile and a half. So what do we get? We get a mile. I don't know if this is enough distance for him. We'll find out. If they go early, I know he's going to run late. We're going to take a look right now at the Gulfstream Park turf. This was his return effort, his first start as a four-year-old. Um, not to be rude, I thought it was a little bit of an inexplicable ride from Nick Juarez. Uh, he was loaded down toward the inside, and I think at that point, you guys get him out into the clear and let him run. Instead, he runs up on heels. He's got nowhere to go. He's got to weave through. He finished very, very well at the very end. I thought it was a good effort. I think I think with some pace, maybe he's got a chance in here, and ultimately with the pick and the play, that's where we go. My pick in here is the number eight channel maker. Uh, I, I made him nine to two. I would play twenty dollars to win on him at nine to two or better. Um, I have a sneaky feeling he's going to get bet. Maybe he doesn't deserve it as far as you know compared to world approval and compared to Ohm and compared to all these other runners. But I have a sneaky feeling he's going to take some money from Mott and Castellano. Uh, I'm also going to play a $10 saver exactly the other way in case world approval is just better than these horses. And Channel Maker comes with his run like I think he's going to do. Uh, I'll play a $10 saver exacta reversing that going 5-8. But I like Channel Maker in here in the Kill Row Mile. We'll find out. Again, the weather's a little bit of an unknown. I think the pace is going to heat up, and I think he can come with a serious run. I think he's a nice horse, better than maybe he has looked on paper, and maybe better than he gets credit for as far as his overall body of work. So, those are the races that we'll go over here on this week's edition of the Matt Bernier Show, the preview edition, uh, the three-year-old preps, the big cap, as well as the Kill Row Mile. If you've been watching live.drf.com, livestream.com, the Daily Racing Form Twitter handle, at DRF Inside Post, as well as the Daily Racing Form's Facebook page. Good on you. Thank you for doing so. If you listen to this podcast like most of you do, YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, video.drf.com. We will be back with the recap edition 
of the Matt Bernier Show. It will not be on live at noon on Tuesday, though, because I won't get back from Florida until late on Monday, so I'll be recording it on Tuesday. It'll be uploaded to video.drf.com as well as YouTube sometime on Tuesday afternoon. So it won't be part of the live programming, but you'll get that at some point on Tuesday. Uh, we'll go over all the three-year-old preps. We'll go over all the stakes races at Tampa as well as down at Santa Anita and everywhere in between. Big day of racing up at Aqueduct as well. You get the Tom Fool and some other good racing as well. Uh, if you listen to the podcast, again, thank you. As we always do with this show, if you've been watching live, you've already checked out the DRF Players Podcast with Peter Thomas Fornital and Jonathan Kinchin. Uh, something to keep in mind, the World Horse Players Tour. You're going to want to try to qualify for that. You can do that on DRF Tournaments. And then, as we always do on this show, the Matt Burning Show, we will lead you into the latest edition of Out of the Gate, the three big derby preps. We'll dive into those in depth, and you get all the usual analysis and fun handicapping stuff from the usual suspects on Out of the Gate. So thank you for listening. Best of luck this weekend, however you're playing, wherever you're playing, whatever you're playing. If you're in the Tampa area, come on out to Tampa Bay Downs. Myself and Marty McGee will be having some fun, hopefully pick some winners. Until next time, best of luck.